This week on Discover the Word, the group would like to take you to a place that you've never been before. Or have you been there? It's the biblical land of Shinar. Heard of it? That's possible that you've run across it while reading through the Bible, but if you're like me, you likely skipped over it, thinking eh, it's just another ancient city or region, and that's as far as you went. But as you'll discover over the course of the next hour, Shinar appears more often and is probably more significant than you may have thought. Our series this week is called, What Happens in Shinar? And I hope you'll travel there with us on this episode of the Discover the Word podcast. And welcome to Discover the Word, the small group Bible study from Our Daily Bread Ministries. And for this study, your friends Mark DeHaan and Elisa Morgan and Bill Crowder and Daniel Ryan Day are at the table. And it will be Daniel leading us in this journey called What Happens in Shinar. Now, you may have heard the saying, what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas, or what happens in Mexico stays in Mexico. Yeah, but does it really? I don't think so. Well, what happens in Shinar definitely does not stay in Shinar. And I think what you'll discover with the group will be eye-opening. And if you aren't friends with us on Facebook or follow us on Instagram, you might want to join that part of the community. Let me just say there will be a couple of interesting posts this week. And one of those posts will grow out of how Daniel gets us into this look at the significance of the biblical land of Shinar. Are any of you fans of detective or whodunit shows? Yes. Okay. <laughs> and favorites. books too. You know, I love a good John Grisham whodunit, but I love Sherlock. Mm-hmm. I always love a, a mystery drama, but I'm not yeah. a fan of one or the other. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. We've been kind of entranced with Bull, which is a really interesting, different kind of take. He's a psychological jury selector, mm-hmm. so he ends up um, solving a lot of mysteries. So, What makes these shows or movies or books so intriguing? A sense of wonder. Mm-hmm. You know, you, yeah. you're trying to put it together. What's going to happen here? How's this going to end? Yeah, and they pull you along and you begin your guessing. I have to admit, sometimes they become formulaic to me and I mm-hmm. lose sometimes. my interest. You know, yeah. It's yeah. like, oh, okay, this person did it, you know. Mm-hmm. The twists and the turns that are mm-hmm. so fascinating. For me, whether I find one of those compelling or not is whether I can really get into the characters. Uh-huh. I mean, if a character is really well developed, and there's a nice surprise at the end, Mm -hmm. then usually I walk away saying, okay, I'm going to read that again. (laughs) (laughs) One of the themes that I've noticed is some of the best episodes of a whodunit are where they introduce you to a bunch of events that seem completely unrelated. Mm -hmm. But then at the end, there's a clue dropped, and all of a sudden all those pieces that seemed unrelated come together yeah. and you go, ah, ha, ha. Fall in place. Yeah. 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 And yeah. those tend to be the best ones yeah. because that wonder and mystery that you're describing, Mart, you get to the end mm-hmm. and it's almost even more mysterious. Like, how did they do that? How yeah. did they pull all that together? So today I want to begin a series of conversations where we're going to approach it similarly. It's going to be like, why are we talking about this? Mm-hmm. And why are we talking about that? But I'm going to be a little more kind and give you the clue ahead of time so that we can (laughs) kind of track it. That may help. Yeah, and so what I want to ask us here at the table and for everybody that's joining us in this conversation is I want them to put on their deer stalkers. Okay, I have no clue what that is. I know exactly what you're talking about. (laughs) Do you? Okay. (laughs) No clue. So I want us to put on our deer stalker hats. And you're doing that. You know we're on radio and our listeners Uh can't see that. Oh, he's got uh, on his Sherlock. Isn't that what Sherlock wears? Exactly, yeah. yeah. And so (laughs) he's got a pipe. (laughs) So the deer stalker hat. I'm going to tweet this. Okay. Is the hat that Sherlock Holmes wears. And Mm -hmm. of course he has the little pipe. And so I want to ask all of us to put these hats on and to follow some little clues that we get about a concept. So this is the clue that I want us to listen for throughout all of these conversations. And that's the Hebrew word shinar, which is a place. And I'll tell us a little bit about the place, and then we'll yeah. read one of the earlier places in the scriptures. Yeah, that how do you spell that? that? In English, you would spell it S-H-I-N-A-R. Okay. And it's not shinar, shinar it's shinar. Shinar. Shinar, okay. okay. So it's a region of land most known for housing the city of Babylon or Babylonia, that area. And that word Babylon or Babel is from an Akkadian word, Babel, 
and it means the gate of the gods. Mm-hmm. And that's going to be important, as we'll see throughout our conversation. There's the clue. Da-dum. Yeah, that's one of the many clues. And Babylon itself, the ruins are located in modern-day Iraq. Okay. Um, it's the plain. So the land of Shinar is the plain between the Tigris and the Euphrates River near the Persian Gulf. And so that's what I want us to listen for, is that location as we read. And we're going to learn a lot about it as we look at these different sections. Okay. Does that sound fun? You got your hats on? Interesting. <laughs> yep. Okay. Yep. yep. Well, somebody read for me Genesis chapter 10, verse 8 through 10. I've got it. Cush was the father of Nimrod, who became a mighty warrior on the earth. He was a mighty hunter before the Lord. And that's why it is said, like Nimrod, a mighty hunter before the Lord. The first centers of his kingdom were Babylon, Uruk, Akkad, Kalnath, and Shinar. Okay, got it. (laughs) In my translation, it reads, the beginning of his kingdom was Babel, Arek, Akkad, all of them in the land of Shinar. Okay. And so we have this space. And is Akkad the same thing as Akkadia that you were talking about earlier? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Whose kingdom now? Yeah. So Nimrod is establishing a kingdom. And where do we find, what is the context of this list of names and specifically where we find this guy Nimrod that shows up? Well, these mm-hmm. are the table of the nations. Is yeah, that what after you're the flood, right? After, after, the, after, flood. The, flood. after flood. the flood and just before the Tower of Babel. And so all these generations from Noah. Okay. And we end up with this guy Nimrod and he builds some cities. And one of those is Babel. There's a lot of different cities mentioned, but I just want to mention that one for a minute because we're talking about this idea of Shinar. Mm -hmm. And all of these are found in this land called Shinar. So that's our first big clue. What is the story of the Tower of Babel about? It's the very next chapter, Genesis chapter 11. What do we see in that story? Well, they're trying to build a tower to reach to the heavens. And I'm struck by that, Daniel, because you said that this meant the gate of the gods. Yeah. And so all of a sudden, building a tower there to reach the heavens makes a little more sense Mm -hmm. because it's the gate of the gods. That's where they expected to interact with the gods, right? Yeah. And where do they move from? Do you see that in the beginning of Genesis 11? It says they move from the east. Oh, toward a plain in Shinar. Toward a plain in Shinar. Mm -hmm. Now it's going to be important. Another clue, Mm -hmm. but we'll talk about it in a second. So they're building the Tower of Babel, this place, the gate of the gods. And what is their goal with this tower? Why are they building it? Well, I think there's a sense in which they're trying to do the same thing that Adam and Eve were trying to do in the garden. Mm -hmm. And that's that they wanted to be like God. Mm -hmm. Yes. Look what we can do as one people, which we find out as the story goes on, that that really is their goal with this tower is to show not only... Are we at the gate of the gods, but we are one of the gods. Mm-hmm. They we want to as people, make a name for themselves, they right? They want to, to make known. a name for themselves. Yeah. yeah, that's the exact phrase that shows up. And so they're building this this tower, which it makes sense that it would be a temple at that time. So mm-hmm. they're making this temple to themselves, not to worship the God, mm-hmm. but to worship the gods, mm-hmm. the little G gods themselves. Mm-hmm. Could there have been any sense, though, at the same time of trying to reach up and have access to the gods? I think so. Yeah, and we get that maybe from the very fact that the word means the gate of the gods. All right. But I think what we see is by them wanting to make a name for themselves, they're trying to elevate themselves to the gods. And okay. that's kind of what Bill was referring to, All right. similar so they're not to Adam and Eve. Yeah, so they're not trying to access the gods for their well-being. They're trying to access the gods to join them. To be like them. I'm guessing they thought that if they could get access to the gods, it would be to their benefit. Well, it says in verse uh, four, let us build ourselves a city with a tower that reaches to the heavens so that we may make a name for ourselves. Okay. Interesting. Yeah. Pretty clear then. Yeah. All right. So now let's go back to the clue about the east. So they move from the east. Do we see that anywhere else in Genesis? That idea of from the east? Isn't the um, departure from Eden? Mm-hmm. From the east Mm -hmm. or to the east? To the east of Eden. So we Mm -hmm. see this departure from God's ideal in Eden to the east away from what God's ideal was, what his perfect desire for them was, and they go east. Do we see any others? Which way does Cain go after he kills Abel? Mm. Mm. Okay. Cain goes to the east. Mm -hmm. So basically what we're seeing with this idea of Shinar, so you have Adam and Eve, leave God's ideal, go to the east. Cain leaves God's ideal, kills his brother, goes to the east. These people in Babel leave this legacy of God rescuing the nations through Noah, and they move east 
to Shinar. And they try to make a name for themselves. They try to be like God. And then exactly in the next chapter, we see that God goes into Shinar, calls Abram to come out. But before that, God goes into Shinar at Babel. And what does he do? He confounds their languages so that they can't continue to advance themselves for their own purposes. Okay, at the great tower. Yeah, Yeah, at the great tower, yeah. And I don't know about you, but that's always been frustrating to me. I haven't really understood it because I'm like, why does God confuse their language? Is it not good for them to be unified? So much of the scriptures is about us becoming one. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So why would God scatter them? There was an interesting comment on that, isn't there, in the scriptures where the the Lord is quoted as saying, if I allow them to continue... Mm -hmm. There's nothing they won't be able to do. I mean, it's... Yeah, Yeah, it's in verse 6 of chapter 11. Nothing they plan to do will become impossible. Yeah, Uh, and the confounding of the languages, I think, is almost like a necessary surgery. Yeah. It's Mm -hmm. a difficult thing, and it's a painful thing, and it's going to have long-reaching consequences. But in this moment, it's a necessary thing in order to fix the problem. So this thing that from the outside might look bad... God scattering them, God confusing their language is actually his rescue Mm. of them from their arrogance, from their pride, from the gate of the little G gods. Mm. He doesn't want them living on their own. He doesn't want them to pursue what they think is best because he knows what really is best. And so he enters in and he rescues them. And then in the very next chapter, we see him go to Abraham and call Abraham from the east back to the ideal. And so, again, we get to see this theme of rescue. And so that's our first clue for these conversations. Shinar is this place that is outside of the ideal of what God has for us. And what we see is that God continues to enter Shinar and bring us back to him. How do you deal with mistakes? Daily, <laughs> minute to minute. Yeah, if I'm by myself, I really kick myself yeah, around the block. Yeah, yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, it depends on what it is. Mm-hmm. But if there's any degree of embarrassment to it, it's just kind of like, uh. mm-hmm. My first instinct is to kick myself. <laughs> My second follow-on instinct is to wonder if maybe it could be somebody else's fault somehow. <laughs> and then my third instinct is to realize, no, it's you. Yeah. <laughs> Do you try to hide it? Sometimes when you know you can't hide it, you try to make a joke out of it. You get the group laughing or whoever's with you well, smiling. It's like a classic, you know, when you trip or something, and you know, how do you handle that? Do you laugh? Yeah. Usually yeah. everybody mm-hmm. tries to laugh to distract from how right. embarrassing that was. And, you know. Well, the first thing you do is look up to see if anybody exactly. noticed. Yeah. We've actually been joking uh, before we started recording about the word Shinar and how it could be Shinar or Shinar. So I could be making a big mistake in all these programs by mispronouncing <laughs> it, right? So, But see, now you're deflecting it with humor. See? Yeah. yeah. But, but that's the nature of the Hebrew language, right? I mean, you're right. dealing with ancient text and we're either going to anglicize it or bring it up to present mm-hmm. day speech patterns or not. So. Yeah, exactly. And we've been talking about this concept of uh, Shinar or Shinar. Yeah. And... We've titled it What Happens in Shinar, and what we're finding already is, and we'll definitely see this the rest of the week, what happens in Shinar definitely doesn't stay there. Okay. (laughs) And so what I've been asking is that we will all take our deer stalker hats and put them on, which are what? Which is like a Sherlock, like the one you're wearing right (laughs) now. Right. (laughs) (laughs) So it's the hat that you see Sherlock Holmes wearing, where it looks like there's two fronts to the hat. Oh. And of course, you usually see him with a pipe, which I have a little plastic fake pipe here. It's a little hard well. to take you seriously, but I'm enjoying it. Yeah. yeah. And so what we're doing is just like Sherlock Holmes follows a series of clues. Mm-hmm. We're following this clue, which is the land of Shinar and this theme throughout the Bible. So today we're going to look at two passages. We're going to briefly touch down the plane on one and then take right back off. And then the second passage we're going to sit in for a little bit. And so the first section is in Genesis chapter 14, verses 1 through 3. But before we read that, what's the context of Genesis chapter 13? Well, there's a conflict going on because there's this one large extended family that's made up of two distinct families. And they're in a little bit of a tizzy about Mm -hmm. grazing land. Who are the family? I mean, is they have it's a name Abraham or not? and Lot. Okay. Or Abram at this point, and Lot, I should say. So the herdsmen get into a fight over, basically, both herds are too big. And there's not enough land for both of them to be this in this close of proximity to each other. And so they're going to separate. And what does Abram do? Does he choose the best land? Does he 
choose first. He actually lets Lot choose mm-hmm. first, which mm-hmm. I find very charming. His mm-hmm. nephew, right? Yeah, yeah, his nephew Lot. He lets Lot choose first, even though he's the senior member of this firm. And where does Lot choose to settle? He takes the best. He takes the mm-hmm. valley, right? Or the yeah, big, and the, or plains. the rich. And we get this sense right away that he's close to some cities that don't have a very good reputation. So he's basically in a plane of what later will be described a plane of wickedness, where yeah. he's close to these cities. And the reason he chose the plane is because the grass was beautiful. I mean, this was the place. If you're going to raise some herds, this is the most beautiful yeah. land you Isn't could Isn't it choose. described as being like Eden, like paradise? Mm-hmm. I mean, back then it was a rich mm-hmm. yeah. Pasture. Whatever it was, it's probably the reason why they built those cities there, right? Exactly. Yeah. Because it was the best possible land, which would have been like Eden. And yeah. there was probably water there. It was yeah. well watered, like the mm-hmm. Garden of the Lord, it said in yeah. Okay, the Genesis Garden of the Lord. 13. So, yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. Mm-hmm. And so Lot settles in the plain where there is wickedness, and where does Abram settle? In Canaan. Yeah, and specifically we get one of the early mentions of the Oaks of Mamre, mm-hmm. this picture of a place where God meets with Abram. And he builds an altar there. And he builds an altar Mm -hmm. there. And so in Genesis 13, which is the context for what we're getting ready to read, we have Lot moving to this plain where there's wickedness. And then you have Abram and this place that represents where God is. So this is Genesis chapter 14, one through three. And, um, since Elisa, you were brave enough to read the names in the last oh, one. There's some let's, big words in here. Let's have Mart read this one. Good job. <laughs> Yay. Well, I vote yes. 14, Go, one through three. Okay. Uh, so it says, about this time, war broke out in the region. And this one king <laughs> and another king. Okay. <laughs> and another king and another king fought against King Bera of Sodom, mm-hmm. King Bersha of Gomorrah, King Shinab of Adma, King... Shemabur of, Z- okay, another king, and the king yep. of Bela, also called Zor. Yeah, so there's a war, and the first king that's mentioned in this section is King Amraphel of Shinar. And, and so, this, my text is of Babylonia. Of Babylonia, yeah. which okay. we learned last time is the same area, same, area. same space. So Babylon, in Babylonia, present day Iraq. in present-day Iraq, is in this plain called the Plain of Shinar. Okay. And so here we have this king from Shinar, and what does he do? He comes in. They grab Lot, we're going to find out, and they take Lot and his whole family captive. Where are they going to take them? To Shinar. Back to Shinar, (laughs) where they're from. Mm -hmm. And how does Abram respond to that? Well, he gets a bunch of folks together and they go after them to rescue them. Yeah. And so just like in Babel, we saw God leave heaven, go into Shinar to rescue. Mm -hmm. So Abram leaves Abram Mm -hmm. leaves the Oaks of Mamre, where God is represented and goes... To the rescue of his nephew. To the rescue of his nephew to bring him out of Shinar. Shinar. Okay, so there's one. Okay. All right, story number two. We're going to fast forward to Jericho, and we don't have time to read the whole section, so what happens at the Battle of Jericho? Quick summary. Josh, fit the battle. The walls mm-hmm. come tumbling down. <laughs> yeah, mm-hmm. and so it's kind of a miraculous story. They surround... The city, they walk around it a few times, which is probably the worst battle plan Mm -hmm. anybody's ever seen. Mm -hmm. But it happens. It falls. The walls Um, fall. The walls fall. So then the Israelites celebrate that victory. And then there's this little town called Ai that's close by. And they're like, with how easy Jericho was, Mm -hmm. we don't even need to send everybody to Ai. So let's just send this small group. But what happens at Ai? They get creamed. And that's because of something that happened at Jericho that they don't know happened yet, or at least most people don't know. At Jericho, what does God say to the people before they go in? Don't take any plunder. Plunder's the stuff they would take after a battle. Yeah, the loot. Yeah, the loot. Yep. And it says in Joshua 7, 1. It says the Israelites were unfaithful in regard to the devoted things. It goes on and he says, Achan took some of them. And so the Lord's anger burned against okay, Israel. And the devoted things would be? The valuables, the treasures. Yeah. The... And here in a second, they mention the things that Achan takes. And that's Joshua chapter 7, verses 20 through 21. Bill, you want to read that for us? Okay. So Achan answered Joshua and said, Truly I have sinned against the Lord, the God of Israel, and this is what I did. 
when I saw among the spoil a beautiful mantle from Shinar, and two hundred shekels of silver, and a bar of gold fifty shekels in weight, then I coveted them, and took them, and behold, they are concealed in the earth inside my tent with the silver underneath it. He took a mantle from Shinar. Why would the author feel it's so important for us to know where that mantle came from, which is basically just a cloak? Yeah. Well, clearly to them, Shinar represented something that was to be stayed away from. Yeah. But by pillaging that stuff, including the thing from Shinar, Achan was in a sense taking them back to that wrong place. And was it an ugly mantle? Was no, it was it, beautiful. It was beautiful. Mm-hmm. Okay, a robe, right? Beautiful mm-hmm. robe. Beautiful right. robe from Shinar. So what happens in the garden? They see this beautiful fruit that is so appealing to the eyes and they eat. Achan sees this beautiful mantle that God said, don't touch, don't take. But it's so beautiful, it's so appealing that he grabs it and he takes it. And it's very significant because of where it's from. It's from Shinar, which again represents this going and doing things our own way. And similar to Adam and Eve hiding Mm -hmm. in verse 21, he hides the robe in the ground inside his tent. So it's a similar hiding after making the mistake. And so I think this is maybe where we can begin to connect a little bit with the story ourselves, because we all know those things in our lives that we see that we know are not God's best for us. We see this beautiful thing that isn't forbidden because God doesn't want us to enjoy life, but it's because God has this amazing picture of the life that he has for us that's so much better than anything that we want, than anything we could even imagine. And yet we see that and we're tempted by it and we grab a hold of it, going away from this perfect picture of what God has for us to what we think is best. And so here's one more clue in our journey throughout these conversations of how here's this place, Shinar, this place where it's away from what God's best is for us. And we have this tendency to go there And God has to continually come in and rescue us from what we think is best because he knows what's best. A couple more mentions of this land of Shinar and what it seems to represent in how people relate to God and how God relates to us. What happens in Shinar is the title of this episode of the Discover the Word podcast. And in just a moment, Daniel is going to take the group to another mention of the land of Shinar. So what would you say is one of the darkest periods in the history of the nation of Israel that we read about in the Old Testament? Now, there are several of them, but in this one, the entire nation is in exile from their homeland. And guess what? Shinar shows up again. All right, we'll go there after we take a quick time out. Now, as we engage in another fascinating study here on Discover the Word, I want to encourage you to check out our discovertheword.org website. There on our website, you'll find our current study, as well as an archive of hundreds of series, thousands of conversations on various topics and passages of Scripture. Many have found that the archive section of the website is a great tool for themselves and also for inviting friends to join the group and study the Bible with us. So click on the Archive tab that's there on our discovertheword.org website. Now, the regular group of Mart and Elisa and Bill and Daniel and Rasul Berry, along with a lot of fascinating guests and classic conversations from when Haddon Robinson and Alice Matthews were part of the group. All that's there, so dig into the archives for a wealth of Bible study material. And now, let's pull our chairs back up to the table with Mart and Elisa and Bill and Daniel as they take us to the next stop in this journey to the land of Shinar and What happens in Shinar? Have you ever experienced the feeling of hopelessness? Yeah. Yes. Yes, sir. Is there a situation where things fell apart that you would be comfortable sharing? I'm thinking of a time when our kids were in their teen years and our son needed help for treatment with addiction. And our daughter was in a car accident And it was a devastating car accident. And she was also injured. And it was Thanksgiving. And Mm. there was a blizzard. And we sat around the table. And we had one dear faithful couple who had trudged through the snow Mm. to come. And it's like we all just looked at our plates, Mm. thinking, I know we should be thankful, but how do we do that here? Yeah. Mm. And I think 
the stories that come to mind I really can't talk about because they're not really just my stories. They're the stories of Mm -hmm. other people. But I remember the emotions. Mm -hmm. I remember driving in a car and yelling at the top of my voice. And there was nobody else in the car, Mm -hmm. you know. And other times when I just was reduced to blubbering, just feeling like everything was out of control. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think we need to stop and just pray right now, Daniel. This is heavy. This Mm -hmm. is hard stuff. It is. Yeah. And for everybody who's listening, I know they've got their moments too. Yeah. Father, thank you that you are always with us. That as we look back, we can see that you were present. And that as each of us is in this moment right now listening, God, we choose to believe what you say is true, which is that you are with us here. Mm -hmm. And I just want to add, Father, that... We're so grateful that in many ways we have perspective now that you've carried us through and you've answered in ways that we didn't expect Mm -hmm. and in ways that some of us probably would never want to trade those times because of what we learned about you. With those thoughts, we do pray for our friends Mm -hmm. and ask you to continue to work in their lives and in ours. Mm -hmm. I agree with that. Amen. That's perfect because that's exactly where we find the Israelites today is in that feeling of complete devastation and hopelessness in the section that we're going to read. We're in a a series of conversations that's been kind of fun up to this point, right? We've been talking about this land of Shinar, and I've been wearing this deer stalker silly hat, which is the hat that Sherlock Holmes wears. And we've been following a clue that points us to the big story of the Bible, this land of Shinar, this place that shows up a few times throughout the scriptures. And we're going to see it show up today too. And the reason we're following that clue is because what we found so far is what? What about Shinar? What about our God who goes into Shinar? Yeah, that God comes to Shinar and rescues us from our worst selves and our Mm -hmm. worst choices. Yeah, which is today the region of Iraq, Mm -hmm. ancient Babylon, a place of many tears for the yeah. for the Jewish people. And various Bible participants, you know, that we have their stories, keep entering Shinar mm-hmm. throughout the history. And we watch what God does. He's a faithful God year after year after year, yeah. decade after decade, century after century. Who rescues his people mm-hmm. from themselves as he rescues us from ourselves. Yeah, let's just say us too. Yeah, 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 yeah me right. too. Yeah, because you think about who we've seen so far. I mean, Cain kills his brother and then he retreats to the worst possible place he could have gone. Lot is taken captive, and he's taken captive into the land of Shinar, and Abraham has to go and rescue him. So it just really seems like it pictures that kind of darkness Mm -hmm. of the kind of things that we were talking about earlier. Yeah. It's a physical place, as you described, Mark, Mm -hmm. but it's also a metaphorical place, a place of it seems that we're separated from God there. And I use the word seems on purpose. Mm -hmm. Um, Mm -hmm. It seems like we're away from what God has for us. It seems that we're pursuing what we think is best. And God keeps entering that and bringing us Mm -hmm. out. So today we're going to see another place where the land of Shinar shows up. Will somebody read for me Daniel chapter 1, verses 1 through 2? In the third year of the reign of King Jehoiakim of Judah, King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon came to Jerusalem and besieged it. And Babylon is Shinar, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. The Lord let King Jehoiakim of Judah fall into his power, as well as some of the vessels of the house of God. These he brought to the land of Shinar and placed the vessels in the treasury of his gods. Now we know from 2 Kings, specifically in chapter 24 and chapter 25, that when they came in, they devastated. What were some of the things that the Babylonians did when they came and besieged Jerusalem and ultimately took it over? Mm. Well, it seems like, at least in the process, that they must have done some destroying of the walls and of the temple building itself because they have to rebuild those Mm -hmm. later in the Old Testament. Yep. Yeah, and they took some of the best and brightest of the Jewish families and and took them back to Babylon. And they took the goods, the treasures. Yeah. Things that Solomon had created for the temple. In the text that you mentioned a few minutes ago in 1 Kings 25, it lists all the stuff that were used in the liturgy of yeah. worship of uh-huh. the people, the pots and shovels and snuffers and dishes for incense and bronze vessels used in temple service. And so it was not only a 
a thievery, but it was a thievery of their religious heritage. Yeah, and in many ways, yes, and in their religious heritage, defeating that, it was as if their God had been defeated, yeah. right. or as if their God, Yahweh, had been brought low, mm -hmm. that he had been humbled. Yeah, and so this really significant concept is brought into Daniel, where it says that these he brought, the vessels of the house of God, he brought from Israel, from the temple. Jerusalem, yeah. From Jerusalem to the land of Shinar, specifically to the land of his gods. And so as we go back to kind of where we started this conversation, this hopelessness, this mm -hmm. devastation, put yourself in the place of the Israelites that have been, I mean, they're in God's promised land to them. They've watched the walls come down. They've been invaded. All their best people are taken out. The temple is not only destroyed, but it's pillaged. Hmm. What would that feel like to watch this temple that represents this relationship with God being pillaged and taken to the land of Shinar? Yeah. I think for the people who are left behind mm -hmm. in Jerusalem, it's a nonstop reminder of this massive defeat that they have suffered and might even cause them to question the validity of their God. For the people who are taken into captivity, it's saying to them that for whatever reason, their God did not choose to prevent this from happening. Yeah. I have shadows of the Holocaust mm -hmm. coming into my mind from this conversation. As Jewish people were taken by force yeah. into trains, all of their possessions piled up, and they are the people of God. And to watch that abuse occur, it's devastating. Yeah. So we've seen a few times already this land of Shinar, this place that is a picture of separation from God. And God, we've seen him come already a few times in and rescue. But today I just, I want us to see something pretty neat as we f finish out. And it comes from... Ezekiel chapter 11, verses 14 through 17. This is the promise that they go into exile with. Uh, maybe we can read around the table. This is Ezekiel chapter 11, verses 14 through 17. Verse 14, then the word of the Lord came to me, mortal, your kinsfolk, your own kin, your fellow exiles, the whole house of Israel, all of them are those of whom the inhabitants of Jerusalem have said, they have gone far from the Lord, to us this land is given for a possession. Verse 16, Therefore I say, thus says the Lord, Though I have removed them far away among the nations, and though I scattered them among the countries, yet I have been a sanctuary to them for a little while in the countries where they have gone. And then in verse 17, it says, I, the sovereign Lord, will gather you back from the nations where you have been scattered, and I will give you the land of Israel once again. Mm. So we have a promise there that God's coming, just like he has so far in the last few conversations. We've seen him come into Shinar. God's coming again. But I don't want us to get to that yet because we've got two more conversations to get there. Instead, I want us to sit with one of the promises that Ezekiel shows us. And we see it especially in chapter 10, verse 18, where he actually watches the glory of the Lord going into exile with the people. Mm. It says here, and this is back in chapter 11. Yet I have been a sanctuary to them for a little while in the countries where they have gone. Even in Shinar, this place that pictures separation from God, God is there and he's their sanctuary. And I think that promise is true for us too, because some of us feel in exile right now. Some of us that, Elisa, that we prayed for mm -hmm, <laughs> at the mm -hmm. beginning of this program mm -hmm. are in situations where they feel like they're in Shinar, mm -hmm. in a place where they can't feel God or know God. And the beautiful promise of this section for us today in Ezekiel is that even when we're in exile, even when we feel as far away from God as we think we can get, God is there and he's our sanctuary. So last time we talked a lot about exile and specifically that all of Jerusalem was exiled where? To Babylon. To Babylon, which is found in the land of what? Shinar. Yeah, which has been our theme throughout the week. We've been, you know, I asked you all to put deer stalker hats on, those hats that Sherlock Holmes wears, and to follow clues. And we've been following this clue of this 
place. And I don't think I've ever even thought about it before, mm-hmm. Shinar. Yeah. Right. And yeah. can I tell our friends who can't see this, <laughs> Daniel still has the hat on. He still on. has the hat on. <laughs> Sherlock Ryan Day. <laughs> is what we're going to have to call And the hard him. thing is I'm getting used to it. That's really yeah. weird. Yeah. I guess I'll have to wear it in future programs as well. <laughs> but what does the land of Shinar really represent at this point? It's a land of other gods. Mm -hmm. Yep, Mm -hmm. absolutely. And it's a land of separation from the true God, right? Yeah. Place of consequence Mm -hmm. because Israel is dearly loved, but they're being brought to their senses. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And we'll really see that today because this theme of the exile continues in a passage that we're going to read from Zechariah. First, before we jump into that passage, does anybody know what the word Zechariah means? It means... The Lord remembers. The Lord remembers. Because you taught me that. (laughs) (laughs) I think this is going to be a pretty key Mm. idea. That theme. Mm -hmm. We heard it last Mm -hmm. time Mm -hmm. because God went into exile with his people. And we're going to see it today. And we need our friends to hang with us because when I read through this section, it is like, what is going on here? It's hard. Because there's a lot of metaphors and ideas. And we're going to see this term wickedness personified as a woman that goes from this place to that. So this is going to be tricky. But what I like what you're doing, Daniel, it feels at times like you're in the weeds, but it's for the purpose of lifting up the big story. That's exactly Mm -hmm. right. I mean, that's the way I've been taking these. Because otherwise we just read it, we get lost in the weeds and never see the story. Yeah. 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 And so last time we saw the people exiled. We saw the vessels that were used for worship in the temple taken from the temple, pillaged and taken to the land of Shinar. And today we're going to see that not only did God go into Shinar in exile with his people, but Shinar becomes the metaphorical place where God sends wickedness, where he exiles wickedness. Hmm. So that's what we're going to see in this as we read. So this is Zechariah chapter 5, verses 5 through 11. And Hmm. um, Hmm. let's just go around and read this section. Okay, the angel who was talking with me came forward and said, look up and see what's coming. What is it, I asked. He replied, It's a basket for measuring grain, and it's filled with the sins of everyone throughout the land. And then a leaden cover was lifted, and there was a woman sitting in the basket. And he said, This is wickedness. So he thrust her back into the basket and pressed the leaden weight down on its mouth. Then I looked up and saw two women coming forward. The wind was in their wings. They had wings like the wings of a stork, and they lifted up the basket from earth and sky. Where are they taking the basket? I asked the angel. And he replied, To the land of Babylonia, where they will build a temple for the basket. And when the temple is ready, they will set the basket there on its pedestal. Yeah. And so the word Babylonia there, the Hebrew word is the word Shinar, which we've seen that they're kind of synonymous anyway. Yeah. Right? Now, before we dive into this passage, I think one thing that's really interesting, and we've talked about this in the Bible, is metaphor, simile, literary devices are used. Mm -hmm. So using a woman personified as wickedness, what else is a woman personified at? Wisdom. As wisdom. Mm -hmm. So I don't want anybody to take this personal. It's not like we're making a statement about a woman or women. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then we actually see two women in this section that are the ones that take the basket who are servants of the Lord, right? So I just didn't want us to get distracted by that as we walk through this passage. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So what's the primary message that we see in this passage? What is happening? What's going on? Is that wickedness is getting taken into Mm -hmm. Shinar and there's going to be a a way where it belongs there. A house Mm -hmm. is built for it and it's going to live and dwell there. Yeah. So the term house, a house being built there, what does that sound like that they're describing? Sounds like a temple. A temple. A place of worship. It's almost as if what he's saying is Shinar is so far gone that Mm -hmm. not only is that where wickedness is sent, but it's worshiped there. Yep. And that fits really well with where we started this conversation talking about Babel that was in the land of Shinar and that word Bavil, which is an Akkadian word that we get the English mm-hmm. word Babel from, it means the gate of the gods. Mm-hmm. This is a place where wickedness is worshipped. This is a place where there's other gods. This is a place where humans worship themselves, like mm-hmm. we saw in that story. Wow. Human achievement. Yeah. All that we can do. And ultimately, what have we seen about, sometimes we have our own ideas about what we think is best. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So is this a sense, Daniel, in which the Lord is basically saying, I'm going to give you what you want. These are the gods you've chosen to worship, so I'll I'll give them to you Mm -hmm. and take you with them into Babylon. Is that? I think the context of this section, so King Darius is now on the throne, 
And so when Zechariah is writing, there's already a movement back to Israel. There's already people that are beginning to come back They've been after in the exile. They've been in Babylon. Uh-huh. And so now this freedom is starting to happen. Mm. And so I think the picture that we see there, to an extent, absolutely, is that God sometimes allows us to go in a certain direction and see that it didn't work out the way we thought it would and that mm-hmm. we needed him. But I think the hope and the beauty of this section is also that what God's doing is he's He's getting rid of all the bad stuff mm. out of the land. Because mm. as you go back to Israel, you can leave your wickedness yes. in Shinar. That's exactly There's right. There's a house okay. for it, and you leave it there, and God's re- yes. restoring us out of it. Okay. Okay, now, somebody might say, okay, I hear you, wickedness. Mm. That sounds like such an old word yeah. and such a heavy word and such a dark word. Or a Disney witch word. Yeah, 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 like, yeah. the wicked witch yeah. of the north or yeah. the south. Yeah. Wizard of Oz yeah. thing, yeah. So... When you talk about wickedness being in a basket and being exiled to Shinar, how's the listener supposed to understand what that is representing? How do you think the listener that heard Zechariah, knowing all these other stories of Shinar, how do you think they would have heard that? Maybe guilt, because they know that they've watched Cain, right? They've watched the people of Babel try to do things their own way. So maybe they hear it in guilt, and that's what this technical word, a direct translation, would be guilt instead of wickedness. Well, and I guess I hear, too, is that there is a tendency to, Mm -hmm. if you will, sin, to be wayward, and then there's the reality of it. Mm -hmm. And when I hear you defining wickedness that way, it's the reality of all of our waywardness that bears fruit of we choose to do it. We choose Mm -hmm. wrong choices, and so therefore we're guilty. So there is this kind of concept of condemnation of I did it. It's mine, Mm -hmm. and an owning of it. And Mm -hmm. it's not very comfortable, but I hear this kind of both and how you're describing it. And in extreme terms. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I think the way that we've kind of been describing Shinar is a place where we try to find life and meaning outside of who God is and who he's made us to be. When we try to do things our own way, when we think that we have a better picture of what this life should look like than God does. Mm -hmm. And so then they get to this promise of Zechariah and it's, hey, not only did God come into Shinar with us, but God's also helping create all that we messed up back home. God's helping make that new too. Oh my goodness. Not only did God send his son, into our human depraved world, but he saves us from it Mm -hmm. and redeems us for the future. And then when we see uh, Mm -hmm. in Revelation 14, eight, it says fallen, fallen is Babylon the great. They finally get to this moment where all evil is destroyed. That's what they're celebrating in that Mm -hmm. section. Mm -hmm. It's not the literal city of Babylon, could be as well, Mm -hmm. but what they're celebrating is the fact that All this doing it my own way and realizing that that leaves me completely Mm -hmm. meaningless. Thinking that I can find life here and finding out that there's only death. Thinking I'm walking in the light, but it's really darkness. All of a sudden, all of that context comes in and we go, it's all destroyed now. Mm -hmm. Fallen, fallen is Babylon the great because of what Jesus did, Mm -hmm. because of his death on the cross. And so I guess the question that I am stuck with or thinking about a lot. And I don't mean this in a pressure like, what am I doing wrong way? But what am I trying to find life in? Mm -hmm. What am I trying to find meaning in and purpose in that God's there and he's like, no, that's never going to work. That's so Mm -hmm. good. We do that every day, all day. Mm -hmm. Look for him in places that are death to us. And I find in my own life that oftentimes those are blind spots. And you know, when it comes to blind spots in our lives, we don't see them ourselves. Mm -hmm. It usually requires someone else who deeply cares about us to realize, hey, you're trying to find purpose in something that's never going to satisfy. God is the only one that can satisfy. And the great thing is next time we get to see how Jesus comes into Shinar, redeems it, and frees us from feeling that need to find meaning and purpose in anything other than God. We're starting to see that Shinar is not just an Old Testament thing, but the land of Shinar is going to carry over to the New Testament as well. Shinar is actually a pretty key part of how the story of the Bible is told. And so keep that Sherlock Holmes deerstalker hat on, and we will explore some final clues of which Daniel says... Now here's the coolest thing. Are you ready? This was the 
drop mic moment. Is this why you're still wearing the Deerstalker hat? This is where I got so excited. Yeah, so find out where this investigation of what happens in Shinar takes us after we take a moment to look ahead to our next study on the Discover the Word podcast. Being around someone who's always talking about themselves and the great things they're doing or how great their kids are, how many really cool things they have, well, that gets really old really quickly, doesn't it? But aren't there some times when, I don't know, it feels like uh, we're getting overlooked. And if we don't brag about ourselves a little, well, no one else is going to do it for us. Well, next time on the Discover the Word podcast, Bill is going to lead a two-part study with Elisa and Daniel and Rasul called To Boast or Not to Boast. Believe it or not, for the next couple of weeks, I'd like for us to think about this idea of boasting or bragging. And I want us to think about times when it's inappropriate, according to the scriptures, and times when the Bible actually says it's okay. Mm -hmm. Now that kind of feels weird. Yeah. There are times when the Bible says it's okay to boast. Well, yeah. Don't miss the next Discover the Word podcast, To Boast or Not to Boast. So now the conclusion of this study called What Happens in Shinar. And I don't know if you could tell, but uh, Daniel really got engaged in sleuthing out what was up with Shinar. And he's waited until this last part of the conversation to share with the group what got him so excited about this. So what was his, as he called it, mic drop moment? Let's find out. Do you have any creative ways of giving people presents, like at Christmas or their birthday or whatever? What are I some just of leave it in the Walmart bag and hand it to them. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. I can't top that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm one of those weird ones, yes. You know, I get all thematic. Not all the time. But, yeah, recently my daughter wanted to go to a specific concert, and it was a stretch to provide that for her, but I knew it would be a really a lifetime experience for her. Mm -hmm. And so I purchased some tickets, but I didn't want to just hand them to her for her birthday. So I wrapped up present within present within present, and each present would give her a clue to what it was. And when she got all done, she didn't know what it was. So I had, I said, now line them up and look at these objects. And she put them all together and she knew what it was. And it was so (laughs) much fun. Ah, It was really fun. Okay. So Elisa, what you described is perfect. Can you see how your experience with your daughter might relate to what we've been doing this week. Because we're looking for the clues. Yeah. That was the first thing I thought of when I was working through this land of Shinar, this idea that shows up multiple times in scripture that we keep getting clues about. And today we get to see the whole picture come together. We've been talking about this land of Shinar, this plain that is in present day Iraq where Babylon was. And what are some of the scriptural clues that we've seen that make this a significant theme in the Old Testament? Well, it was the place where they built the Tower of Babel. Mm -hmm. I think you told us that the word Babel means the gate of the gods. And so it was their attempt to rise up and join the gods in some way. Yeah. Yeah. And I love the way in that conversation, Sir Daniel, you pointed out that God did confuse their languages Mm -hmm. to stop the project, this tower. But there's a sense in which he did it to rescue them from themselves. Yeah. If he had allowed them to go on thinking that they were sovereign over their own lives, it would have been at their expense. Yeah. And that's one of the themes that we've seen is this land of Shinar represents this life trying to do it on our own, this life away from God. And God continues to reach his hand in Mm -hmm. and rescue. And so we saw that at Babel. Did we see that anywhere else? Well, we saw it even um, with Lot, with... Mm -hmm. um, Adam and Eve, everybody going to the east, mm-hmm. away towards this area of Shinar, which came truly really to represent our waywardness. Mm-hmm. Eventually, and this is where we began to get in the last couple of days, eventually we see that this place is actually established as a place where we can leave our wickedness, where we can yeah. leave our waywardness, and God will give us an ultimate rescue mm-hmm. from it eventually through Jesus. But you know that it's troubling to us until we get up above it the way you've invited us to, Daniel, to see the bigger picture that this is a reality of our condition, Mm -hmm. which we continue to choose at different times to be away from God. Yeah, we choose to go there and he, in his grace, (laughs) in his time, graciously brings us back, rescues us and leads us back out. Yeah, I think the part that hit me was that uh, when Israel itself went into Shinar, God himself 
went with them and was yeah. a sanctuary for mm-hmm. them. I mean, even though this was exile, even though this was discipline because of their sinful uh, lifestyles, but there's this loving correction in there because God goes with them. Yeah. yeah. And he's there with yeah. them. Yeah. And we have been galloping all over the Old Testament. It's mm-hmm. so interesting. This hasn't been a neat and tidy chronology, but in the people group of Israel, there is a continual decade after decade, century after century of returning to this and God's continued provision Mm -hmm. to provide a way out of it. And last time we got to see how wickedness is exiled to Shinar Mm -hmm. and God promises to reach his hand in, right? And save to rescue. And today we get to see what that really looked like. How did God do that? How did he rescue Mm -hmm. us from the situations we put ourselves mm-hmm. in, where we try to do things on our own, thinking we can find meaning and purpose in life and outside. something that is self-destructive, That's right? right. Mm-hmm. Yeah, exactly. And that hurts one another. So let's see the promise. Isaiah chapter 11, verse 10 through 11. Let's see how God is going to rescue us from Shinar. And listen for that word, Shinar. On that day, the root of Jesse shall stand as a signal to the peoples. The nation shall inquire of him and his dwelling shall be glorious. On that day, the Lord will extend his hand yet a second time to recover the remnant that is left of his people from Assyria, from Egypt, from Pathros, from Ethiopia, from Elam, from Shinar, from Hamath, and from the coastlands of the sea. He will raise a signal for the nations and will assemble the outcasts of Israel and gather the dispersed of Judah from the four corners of the earth. How hopeful. Mm. God's going to go out into all the earth, even more than just Shinar, and bring his people home. Mm. Now, this uh, section, Isaiah chapter 11, what is this chapter about? Clearly, whatever it's about has to do with the root of Jesse, Mm -hmm. right? And that's really the prophecy of Jesus coming. And where do you get that, Bill? Well, in the very first part of verse 10, on that day, the root of Jesse shall stand as a signal to the people. And it actually starts in verse one. A shoot will come up mm-hmm. from the stump of Jesse, and from his roots a branch will bear fruit. And that's a reference yeah, to my Jesus. Translation says, Out of the stump of David's family there you go. I will grow a shoot, yes, a new branch, bearing fruit from the old root. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so we have this promise, this messianic promise of God rescuing. Last time we saw God sending (laughs) wickedness to Shinar. And here we see God going into Shinar and rescuing the good out, the Mm -hmm. people that he loves out, his people. Mm -hmm. And he's going to do that through the promised Messiah. And so here's another picture of God going into Shinar and rescuing. Now, who is that promised Messiah? Of course, it's Jesus, right? And so Jesus came down out of heaven into, can we say Shinar, <laughs> right? That we live mm. the whole world. And yet the, the interesting thing is he came into Jerusalem. Yeah. Mm. I mean, so again, he came into a community who wanted to believe that they were his people, yeah. his chosen ones, and they were the ones who demanded his death. There's such irony here. Yeah. It was Babylon-like. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. There's sh- Shinar everywhere. There's yeah. Shinar everywhere. <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> and and I, th- and I think that is the issue that we can't escape is that not only is Shinar everywhere, Shinar is everywhere because we're everywhere. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. Right. We're Shinar in so many yeah. ways. And yeah. so we've seen this pattern over and over again of God having to leave where he is and where in the garden where we were with him mm. and we left. Yeah. I mean, technically, yes, God said you can't be in this space anymore, but it was because of the decisions we made, Mm -hmm. right? Right. And then we see Cain leave Mm -hmm. after he kills his brother, and we see the people move into Babel and try to build this temple to their own human achievement, and God leaves heaven again and comes in Mm -hmm. and rescues them from their self-destruction. And then we see Abram be a picture of God by going into Shinar and rescuing Lot, and then over and over and over again, we've seen up all the way through to Zechariah, mm. where we actually see the banishment of mm. wickedness and God going in to rescue. Mm. Now, here's the coolest thing. Are you ready? This was the drop mic moment. Is this why you're still wearing the deer stalker hat? This is where I got so excited. Someone please read First Peter 5.13. As we read this, I just want us to rem- remember Shinar, Babylon, Babylonia, 
all of that is the same area. So Got it. Okay, this is from 1 Peter 5, verse 13, and these were Peter's parting comments at the end of this letter, okay? And he has all these greetings and such, and in verse 13 he says, She who is in Babylon, chosen together with you, sends her greetings, and so does my son Mark. Greet one another with a kiss of love. Who's she? Well, my translation says, your sister church in Babylon hmm. sends yeah, you that's greetings. that's what mine says too. Yeah. That's even better. Your sister church where? And Shinar. And Shinar in <laughs> Babylon. And so we've been watching God enter mm. Shinar and rescue mm. over and over and over again. And then we saw in Revelation last time how one day we get to celebrate that Babylon has fallen, this metaphorical place where we try to find meaning outside of who God is. Mm. And the amazing thing is that God is already doing that redemptive work. Mm. He's already present in Shinar. He's there right now. In fact, there's a church there. It's exactly what we would expect from God, <laughs> and it always surprises us. Yeah. And I love how it's it's already happened, but we yeah. read it 2,000 years after it's happened. God's already provided the rescue, but we watch him continually rescuing us all yeah. the time because of what Jesus did yeah. for us. And in, in the middle of it all, there's a sense in which God doesn't seem to be with us. He doesn't let us see that he really is, as the scriptures say, the God who says, I will never leave you. Mm -hmm or forsake you. God can even plant a church in a place that metaphorically represents the most wicked of wickedness because God can redeem the worst of people, the worst of places, and he can redeem us too. Yeah, great series of conversations on this edition of the Discover the Word podcast because like Daniel just said, when we realize that God can redeem the worst of people and the worst of places, we know that he can redeem us, too. Well, you've been part of another Discover the Word study with Martin Hahn, Lisa Morgan, Bill Crowder, and Daniel Ryan Day, a study called What Happens in Shinar. Now, Discover the Word is a small group Bible study from Our Daily Bread Ministries in Grand Rapids, Michigan, in which we invite you to walk with us through topics and passages that inform the way we read the scriptures, challenge us as we live our lives as followers of Christ, and always point us to discover Jesus in the pages of the Bible. Now in closing, I want to thank you for helping us to make life-changing resources like Discover the Word, the Our Daily Bread devotional, and lots of other Bible engagement resources available to people in over 150 different countries around the world. It is the voluntary giving of friends like you that makes all of the resources from Our Daily Bread Ministries possible. You can partner with us by giving online at discovertheword.org Simply click on the Donate tab. Well, thanks for listening to this edition of the Discover the Word podcast. I'm Brian Hedinga, and Discover the Word is provided by Our Daily Bread Ministries.